our service off with Shine, Jesus Shine, and it's icing. Uh, when you hear the music, please.
to the to the throne of grace, those that are going through difficult times within the fellowship. So Lord, you know each and every one of our brothers and sisters in this fellowship that are going through difficult times either due to health or spiritual darkness or just being attacked by Satan. Lord, you know how our families are living. Lord, you know that some walk with you, but some don't walk with you. Lord, you know that some walk, but have fallen away. Lord, we just lift each and every one of them to you. We ask that your hand will be upon them, that you will draw close to them, that they will know and feel your presence, Lord, because your word tells us I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So Lord, we just pray that you will open their eyes, that they may see, and that they may hear your still, small voice speaking to them. Lord, we thank you for the love that you have for each and every one of us. We just pray that as we live our lives each day, that you will keep us true to the gospel, true following the Holy Spirit, reading our word, your word and just praying. Lord, we just pray that people will find it in their hearts to come and join us more and more over these Sundays and Tuesdays, Lord. Lord, we're coming up very soon to the week of prayer. We just pray that people will come and join us. Because Lord, your word says very clearly, do not forgo meeting together. And Lord, there's a reason for that. That's where we get our strength. So Lord, help us to be mindful that if we're feeling of staying away, then it's Satan that has come us to do it. It's not you, because that would be strictly against your word. So Lord, we pray that you'll be with us the rest of this evening. And after this next hymn, we pray to be with Samuel as he comes to speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, our next hymn, Tell Out My Soul. And with Samuel music.
evening, everyone. It's uh, lovely to be back again with you. I was, I was here for a midweek. Uh, I think it was close to the start of the year, um, but it's kind of the time's flown since then. It's uh, yeah, things have changed quite a lot as well. I'm starting in the Irish Baptist College tomorrow morning, so uh, I really, really value your prayers for that as well. Um, yeah, things have kind of changed quite drastically for me in the past few months. But uh, it's a real privilege and joy to get to be here and to get to share the Word of God with you. I would invite you to turn with me to the letter of Jude. The letter of Jude. It's that very small, kind of odd little book at the very back of the Bible, just before Revelation. And the, the verses we'll be thinking about tonight are verses which are very, very familiar to us, I'm sure. Verses we've heard many, many times. Uh, but we'll begin considering verse 24 and 25. I want to just read a little bit from the start of the, the book, just to give us a little bit of context to it first. Uh, so we'll begin our reading here in verse 1. Verse 1 of the letter of Jude. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write, appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in on the list, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master, and Lord Jesus Christ. I want to just pause our reading there for a moment, uh, just to kind of get a bit of the context here. Uh, Jude is writing uh, to a scattered group of exiles. He's writing a letter and he identifies those he's writing to as those who are called, those who are beloved in God and kept for Jesus Christ. And he wanted to write this letter encouraging them, he wanted to write this letter and building them up in their joint faith. But he realized there was another Thing which was necessary for him to do. He had to warn them against those who were perverting the gospel among them. Uh, and so basically from verse 5 right the way down to around verse 16, uh, he gives examples which are warning these believers of the various ways in which the gospel is being uh, distorted among them, the various aspects of the gospel they had to look out for, uh, the things they had to hold on to. And, and then by means of encouraging them, uh, in verse 17, he says, Remember the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you in the last time, there will be scoffers, those who follow their own ungodly passions. So he basically says, all this was to be expected. This opposition, this, uh, this perversion of the gospel was all uh, going to happen. Uh, it was bound to happen. You were told it would happen. So he says, don't be surprised. But instead, in verse 29 and verse 23, he gives them this charge. But you beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. He says, don't just uh, not be surprised, but also be different from what you see around you. Behave in a way that's different. And so he gives them this, this very strong charge. And then suddenly we get to verse 24 and 25. Verses which seem completely different, verses which seem in some ways slightly out of context. So we're going to read these verses together. This is where our focus will be this evening. Verse 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory majesty, dominion, and authority, before all time, and now, and forever. Amen. Let's just take a moment, just before we consider these verses, just to pray again briefly. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have of being able to open up your word together. Lord, we thank you that we're able to have this word in our language. Uh, there is no barrier to us in it, Lord, it's a freedom and a privilege which we far too often take for granted, but Lord, we pray that even as we come to these verses which may well be familiar to us, 
God, I pray that even our familiarity with these verses wouldn't uh, take away from what you want to say to us through them. God, that we would approach these verses with an eagerness and a willingness to learn what it is that you want to teach us. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. I wonder what your memory is like. Um, my memory is, I genuinely think my memory is getting worse. In the past few months, it's just been a bit of a disaster. This afternoon alone, I walked into my office three times trying to remember what I wanted. And every single time I had to walk back out to try and remember, it was an absolute disaster. It turns out I wanted a pen, which was behind my ear the whole time. Um, but I, I feel like forgetfulness is a problem that we all struggle with to one degree or another. And it's always the important things that we seem to forget. You can remember silly little irrelevant things, but sometimes it's the big picture that we're really, really quick to lose sight of. And I think that's the problem that Jude was trying to address right the way through this letter. Despite the, the way it seems to change, and he seems to change what he's saying at various points and change his focus, throughout the entirety of this letter, he is reminding them of something. He's starting out by wanting to remind them of their joint salvation. He wants to remind them to celebrate their faith, to celebrate what they know, to bring it to the forefront of their minds. But then the situation demanded, demanded other priorities, so he decided that he was going to have to write one that is a letter of mandate, a letter of charge to keep the faith. He reminds them to stand strong, to hold to the truth and not to waver. But then verses 24 and 25 he just, as we've said, seems to divert. He seems to break into something that's completely new. And he gives uh, what we would often call a doxology uh, or, or a really succinct presentation of the truths of our faith. Uh, and I'm sure it's something that's familiar to many of us. If we've been in church circles for long enough, you'll have heard it said at the end of a service as a benediction. But I wonder, have we ever stopped to consider what it is saying to us? Have we ever stopped to consider what was Jude's purpose in including it at the end of this book? What was he trying to remind them of in these moments? And I actually think these two verses, more so than just helping us unpack the letter of Jude, these two verses give us encouragement and challenge which help us in our daily lives. So if I had to kind of put a title over what we'll be thinking about this evening, I would call it Doxology for Daily Life. And I want us to consider three things this evening. I want us to consider the end that awaits. I want us to think about the glory that belongs. And I want us to think about the perspective glass. The end that awaits, the glory that belongs, and the perspective glass. So with this idea of the end that awaits, uh, I want us to dig into verse 24. Verse 24, he begins, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. I don't know if you picked up on it. It's, it's quite easy to miss. Right the way through the book of Jude, there is the theme of keeping. Uh, he begins addressing it to those who are kept for Jesus Christ. Um, he, he speaks, uh, I think it's in verse uh, 6, uh, of those uh, angels who had rejected authority, who are being kept for judgment. Then he speaks later on in verse 21 of our responsibility to keep ourselves in the love of God. And then here in verse 24, we see him speaking of this one who is able to keep us. The whole book seems to revolve around keeping in one way or another. And as we come to consider who this one is that keeps us in verse 24, the word keep, it means to, to be guarded. It means to be protected or to, to keep secure. Um, preserved from falling is the way that some uh, translations will put it. Uh, what it's really meaning is this idea of giving good footing to someone, to, to make exempt from any possibility of even being able to fall. This is more than just an idea of us being kept from falling away from the faith and then the rest is somehow up to us. This is a, a keeping of God which is active, it's continual, it goes right into the day and daily of our Christian lives. H.B. Charles, an American preacher, he was speaking on this passage. He draws our attention to the fact that what's being spoken of here isn't sort of a keeping that's taken place in the past and is just in the past. It's not just a keeping that will take place in the future, but it is a present, active, continual keeping. 
he, he draws to our attention that quite often we thank God as believers for having saved us from sin and we look forward to this idea that we will one day be saved completely from sin but we very rarely think about how much of a miracle it is that on a daily basis God keeps us from being as sinful as we could be. We're still daily being kept from sin. And the idea here isn't some sort of thought that there is some sort of imaginary line of apostasy that God is stopping us from falling across. The idea here rather is a picture of God actively at work, like a father holding the hand of his child, ensuring that that child's feet won't slip. It's a keeping which grants complete security to the believer. It grants an assurance to the believer that we can rest this evening in the keeping power of Christ. We're we're not saved by our own strength. We're not saved by anything in ourselves, but we're saved by the power of our Savior, by what he has done for those who believe in his atoning work at Calvary. And Philippians 1 and 6 tells us that, uh, that we can be confident in this, that he who began a good work in us will bring it to completion at that day of Jesus Christ. We're secure in the knowledge of our salvation this evening as those who believe because our salvation isn't anything of ourselves. It's God's work which he works in us and works through us. And it's in his power, it's in his ability to keep us from stumbling that we can rest. So then that raises the question, is that that it? Do we just kind of take our hands off? We can sit back and relax as it were. How does that work in the context then of verse 21? Where 21 says, keep yourselves in the love of God. Well, there's a little bit of a tension between those two verses. but It's not too difficult to understand. We know that whenever we come to a saving knowledge of Jesus, that our salvation comes in stages. There's our justification where we are saved from sin, that Christ's righteousness is transferred to our account. uh, And we're made righteous completely and wholly in the eyes of God. And that's already happened for those of us who have trusted in Christ. But then there's our sanctification. This active, ongoing process. And then in the future there is our glorification which is yet to come. And all of these have been secured for us. But not all of them have been fully realized or brought to completion in us. And so this sanctification, this ongoing process whereby sin is being removed from us. Will continue until either Christ returns or calls us home. And that process of sanctification is what we see between these two verses. As we're instructed to keep ourselves in the love of God. And as God himself keeps us from stumbling. That tension that we see is sanctification in process. It's the process whereby God works within us through the power of the spirit. Uh, The psalmist speaks of this idea actually a lot, but an example would be Psalm 63 verse 8. He says, my soul clings to you and your right hand upholds me. That as we grow in our love for God, as we grow in our desire for God, as we keep ourselves in the love of God, God himself keeps us there. And we do this in the sure and certain hope that one day all sin, all remnant of it will be completely removed. That hope is what motivates us as we seek to put to death the remaining sin in our lives. It's the hope which Jude describes in verse 21, where he gives that charge, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. So we're being kept for this, kept for this hope which is awaiting us, which is before us, the hope that one day we will be completely free from sin. Well, see verse 24 with me again as we consider this hope that lies before us to him that's able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. One day we will be presented before God. As those who trust in him, we will be presented blameless, absolutely perfect. The word that's used for blameless here, Jude, uh, is using, um, it's a word that's used in Peter's first letter as a description of Christ himself. He says in 1 Peter 1 verse 18, he says, knowing that you were ransomed with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish. 
So, so as Jude describes that we'll one day be presented blameless, without blemish, that blamelessness, that perfection can only come from one person. The one person who was perfect. That one person that Peter has described as the one without blemish or spot. When we are presented or literally made to stand before the presence of his glory, the only way in which we will be blameless is through the blood of Christ. Through his justifying work in our lives. And this does bring to our attention that there is coming a day where we will stand before God. There's coming a day where we will be presented and the standard for acceptance on that day is blamelessness perfection and so I do want to challenge you this evening whose righteousness will you be relying on on that day when that day comes when you stand before God you have to give an account of yourself and the standard to be accepted is blameless will you be relying on your own attempts at righteousness do you think you can be just good enough to get there because you can't The Bible tells us all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. The only possible way we can be blameless is through the blamelessness of Christ being given to us. If Christ was blameless for you, Christ alone saves. He is the one who has made the way for us to be blameless, to be secured, to be kept, so that one day we can be presented before God in righteousness. As Jude shows in, in verse 4, uh, in verse 6, right through the letter, there, there is a punishment which awaits those who are not blameless. There's a condemnation that's awaiting those who reject God, who reject his way of salvation. The judgment that awaits can only be avoided in the salvation that Christ offers. So I would urge you tonight, if you haven't already, to look to Christ. Because that day is coming. Put your trust in his sacrifice at Calvary. Turn from your sin and ask him to make you blameless in his sight. That day is coming. But for those of us who are in Christ, what a day that is going to be. That day when Christ's work of atonement that was completed at the cross but then is brought to full fruition in us. as It's fully applied as we stand perfect before God with Christ's righteousness as our own. Made blameless, not just blameless in God's sight, but with every trace of sin gone, able to glorify God without any aspect of sin holding us back. What a thought it is for the believer to never sin again, to never have to wrestle with sin again, to be free from it. To be free to glorify God with every faculty that we have to the fullest. What a glorious hope that we have to be presented blameless. But to be presented blameless to whom? Well, to himself. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 24 references this. He says, so that he, that is Christ, might present the church to himself in splendor. That she might be holy and without blemish. So Christ will present his bride, the church, all those who are believing in him, those who are kept, he will present them to himself. But then in Colossians 1.22 we're told that he will present us to God the Father as well. He'll present us to himself in part of this mystery of their triune relationship. And I think there's a point of encouragement for us here that is extremely easy to miss. And that is that Christ will complete the work which he has begun in us. Because he has a charge to his father to present us blameless. And he hasn't died on the cross for us and risen from the dead for us and ascended to heaven to intercede for us to now stop before the end. He will complete this work by presenting us to the father with great joy. There's a little bit of debate among commentators as to whose joy this is. Uh, Is it our joy as we're presented? Is it Christ's joy as he presents us uh, as his bride? It's no real leap to imagine that it's both. Of course, we'll experience this great joy as the fulfillment of our waiting here on earth, uh, as the full application of our salvation in Christ is revealed. 
when we experience that glorification, this final stage of our salvation, of course we'll experience joy. But there is a real sense here in which Christ will take joy in presenting us before the Father. See Hebrews 12 verse 2, it says, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. What a thought it is that Christ will take joy in us as his bride as he presents her ransomed, redeemed and perfected before his father. What a joy, yes, will be ours, but what glory will be Christ's on that day. He'll take joy in us, not because of any intrinsic value in ourselves, not because of anything of us, but because of his completed work within us. What a glorious day that will be. And that should lead us to an overflow of praise, an overflow of thankfulness for what God has done for us, which is exactly what Jude does in verse 25. I want us to consider the glory that belongs. See verse 25. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Let's consider just for a few moments the the one to whom this glory belongs. He's described here as the only God. The only God. He stands unique. He stands alone. There is no one who can even be compared to him. He's the only one who is God. He's the only one who is holy. He's the only one who is all-powerful. He's the only one who, as we've seen from the previous verse, can keep us from stumbling. He's the only one who can make us blameless. There's no one like him. He's glorious in his uniqueness. Some translations have the word wise in here. Some manuscripts don't, but the the principle is the same. He's unique and his attributes are on display in everything that he does. He's wise in his creation of the universe as he weaves the web of time and providence and salvation. Uh, And that leads us to the next words. Yes, glory is due to him because of who he is, but glory is due to him beyond that in his relationship to us. He's described here as our saviour. This is a God who is personal. A God who has a personal relationship with us. And his relationship here is one of a saviour. And this is where, for me, as I was studying this, it kind of, once it hits you, it is completely mind-boggling that God is glorified in his relationship to us as our saviour. He's glorified through his saving work in our lives. In his plan of salvation in the past through that plan being woven out through time. And that plan fulfilled as Christ came and lived a perfect life. And died the death that sinners deserve to die. And he's glorified as Christ rose from the dead sealing that work as finished. He's glorified as Christ sits in heaven interceding for us. In every aspect of salvation's plan, he's glorified. And he will be glorified when he presents us blameless. On this future glorious day when our salvation is fully realized. Yes, God is to be worshipped because of who he is. And he is to be worshipped by his people because of who he is to them as saviour. But he goes on here to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority. Each of these words conveys something ever so slightly different. Um, Glory, uh, for those of you interested, it's it's the Greek word doxa from which we get the word doxology. Um, It it has a wide range of meanings across the New Testament. Uh, It can mean glory, splendor, brilliance. But there's one dictionary which defines it as this. From the base meaning of the awesome light that radiates from God's presence and is associated with his acts of power. This isn't some sort of idea that we can lay glory upon God, that we can ascribe it to him or we can grant it to him or or lay it upon him. This idea is that this glory emanates from him. The idea here is that God is glorious, but we just worship him for it. He is the source of all glory. To him be glory. And we see the word majesty. The word for majesty here, it's only used twice 
elsewhere in scripture, both in Hebrews where it speaks of the right hand of the majesty on high. It's not just conveying an attribute. Uh, it, it's, it's not just a, kind of a name in the way that we would use it for uh, the royal family or for a sovereign. This goes far beyond that. That the very character of God is majestic. And we see dominion. The word meaning power or strength. Again, part of the character of God. That he is all powerful. That his power is at work in creation as it sustains the universe. It remains on display for us in everything that he does. Of course, his greatest display of power is seen in his victory over sin and death at the cross. This is a God who has dominion over all things. He has authority and sovereign control over all things. To him belongs all glory, majesty, dominion and authority. And again, by way of encouragement, I want us just to consider for a moment the extent to which these attributes belong to him. If you see at the end of verse 25 before all time and now and forever from before all time from before the universe even existed from before creation right down through history as God sovereignly ordained everything that would come to pass everything that would ever be all glory even from before the beginning of time is his and that's true right from eternity past right into eternity future All glory, majesty, dominion, authority belong to him before all time and forever. And I think we can even, we we can look to the past and we can see God's glory as as it works out through time. And we can even, with with the eye of faith, we can look to the future and we can see uh, this idea that on that day when he returns, yes, all glory will belong to him. uh, As every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, We we can see how God will be glorified in that. But that isn't all that Jude says. Jude says here that all authority, glory, majesty, dominion belongs to him before all time and now and forever. These attributes belong to him now. And and this can be hard for us to see sometimes in our our current social climate, in uh, in our time where everything seems to be being done to keep God out of the picture. Where everything is being done to glorify man instead of God. To show that man is the one who's in control. That man defines law. Man defines gender. Man defines where life begins. Defines what's right and what's wrong. But even despite all of those appearances. God is the one to whom belongs all dominion. And glory. And majesty and authority. All authority belongs to him alone. Not only is this true on a global level, but this is true on a societal uh, level. And it's also true for us on a personal level. And this is where things kind of get gritty and, and harder to apply for us. But regardless of what circumstances look like, God is the one who is in complete sovereign control. Even when you get the phone call that you were dreading, when you get the diagnosis that you weren't expecting, when your employer hands you a redundancy letter, when you uh, experience that loss of a friend, whatever the case may be, whatever trial or difficulty you're going through, this doxology stands to remind us that God is still God. It stands to remind us that God is still on the throne That God is a God who keeps his promises. That he is a God who never changes. There will never be a time where this God is not in sovereign control. And that includes this very moment. And I know it can be hard for us to see. It can be hard for us to, uh, to, to apply in our daily situations. But as we come to try and glean some more encouragement from this. I want us to see one more thing this evening. I want us to see the perspective glass. The perspective glass. I don't know how many of you have read Pilgrim's Progress recently. Um, About a year ago I was in London. I had the chance to visit uh, John Bunyan's grave. uh, And I was inspired again to read the Pilgrim's Progress. uh, Because on his grave it just says author of the Pilgrim's Progress. And I thought I haven't read that for a while. I better dig it out. And as I was was studying Jude. I, I saw this wonderful parallel between a part of the allegory it stood out to me it's a part where Christian and his friend Hopeful have just escaped from Doubting Castle they've just escaped from giant despair uh, and they find their way to the delectable mountains 
Uh, And when they're there, they meet these shepherds who guide them, who show them these warnings against error. Uh, They show them how far they have left in their journey to the celestial city. Uh, And they see how far away in the distance that celestial city is. uh, And they begin to feel this concern as to will they ever make it there. But they're reassured by the shepherds. And as part of this reassurance, the shepherds take them to a high hill and give them a telescope called perspective glass. And as they look through this glass, they're able to just make out something of the glory of the celestial city. And as they do so, their hearts are so encouraged that they're able to go on their way, not just kind of dragging their feet, but they're able to go on their way singing. And I think... As I read that and as I read this doxology from Jude, that their hearts were encouraged because even though the celestial city still seemed so far off, even though there were so many trials and difficulties which lay between, despite all of the the difficulties which had lay behind them, despite every possible thing that was in their way to to seek to kill them, that was going to seek to injure them, that was going to try to bring their pilgrimage to a stop, they knew that they had an end before them which was secure. They knew that they had an end which was sure and certain. And seeing the glory of that city reminded them of that. And I think that's partially what Jude is doing for us here in this last two verses of his letter. He's acknowledging, yes, the journey is going to be difficult. Yes, we will have to contend for the faith in the face of opposition. Yes, we will have a difficult path to walk to keep ourselves in the love of God. But the end that awaits us is sure. The end that awaits us is eternally sure through Christ. And there is, praise God, a king, as it were, in that celestial city. To whom belongs all glory, majesty, dominion and authority. And I want to suggest to you that Jude gives us these two verses to use as something of a perspective glass. In times of confusion, in times of difficulty, in times where we're struggling or we're just not quite sure what to do. Jude encourages us to pick up these two verses and to to see the end that awaits us. To see this one to whom the glory belongs. I don't know where you're at in your Christian life. I don't know how far along that pilgrimage is at where you are. Whether you've maybe just started out, maybe you're closer to home. I don't know what challenges you face, what you're going out into in this week. I don't know what you struggle with even in your own mind. But what I do know is this. That for those of us who are in Christ, there is a wonderful end that awaits us. Being kept by God until one day we're made blameless and presented before him. And for those of us who are in Christ, we have a wonderful, personal God. A God who is in control of all things from eternity past, now, to eternity future. Who is working all things out for his glory and also for the good of his people. We need to start viewing things through that lens this evening. To live every aspect of our lives with this view of what lies ahead of us, the end that awaits us. It was just like Christian and hopeful in the pilgrim's progress. When our eyes are fixed on that celestial city, the pain of the journey, the difficulties of the way that we may be experiencing, they don't go away, they don't disappear, but they pale in comparison to this eternal weight of glory that lies ahead of us. When you know that you have a glorious king, who is working out all things for your good, regardless of how things may appear on the surface, When you know that he is constantly working to bring you to that expected end. Namely to present you blameless before him. When you know that every trial, every difficulty that you will go through in this life has been ordained by him to bring you closer to that purpose. How much sweeter those trials can become. When you think you can't go any further. When your strength in those trials wavers. Just to know that this is the God who is able to keep you. To hear him saying in the words of that hymn, Fear not, I am with thee, O be not dismayed. For I am thy God and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee and cause thee to stand upheld by my righteous omnipotent hand. The journey that lies before us may be difficult. 
just as we close, I just want to read uh, just two verses from Hebrews 12. The verses which we've already read this evening. Verses, Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And here's how we unlock all of this. Looking to Jesus. The founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Fix your eyes on Christ. Keep your eyes fixed on this one who is the only one who can keep you from stumbling. See him there on this throne in control, sovereignly ordaining all things for your good. See every trial that he ordains for you, for the purpose for which he has ordained it, to turn you into who he wants you to be, to make you like Jesus, to present you one day blameless before him. Trust Christ to keep you from stumbling until that day. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the assurance that we have in your word of who you are, for your people. God, we pray that you would help us to see more and more and to feel and to experience that keeping power in our lives. As you keep us from stumbling, as you keep us through trials, and God, we thank you for that end which awaits us as your people. We thank you for all the benefits and blessings that we have in Christ. God, give us the eyes to be able to see them. Give us the perspective to see these things in our lives so that we may live more for your glory. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. We're going to close our time together this evening by singing the words of the hymn that's before us, standing on the promises of Christ my King.
Father, we thank you that as we stand on the promises of your word, as we stand on the firm foundation that is Christ Jesus, Lord, we know that we will not fail, we will not fall, because Christ cannot fail. Lord, we thank you for this security that we have through the storms and through the difficulties of life. We can rest in Christ. We can rest in you and what you have achieved for us and who you are to us. God, we thank you. God, we pray that you would grant to us more of a vision of this on a day-to-day basis, that we would be caught up with the glory of who you are, that we would be caught up with the joy and the hope that we have eternally waiting for us. And that we would live in the light of it. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. And to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God our saviour through Jesus Christ our Lord. Be glory, majesty, dominion and authority. Before all time and now and forever. Amen.